Lorenzo Chiesa. He is the director of the Genoa School of Humanities and visiting professor at the European University um, at St. Petersburg and at the Freud's Dream Museum of the same city. He was previously professor of modern European thought at the University of Kent, where he founded and directed the Center for Critical Thought. Um, Chiesa recently conducted a really exciting seminar here at Grand Prava, where he spoke about uh, Kafka, connecting and, and spoke about three uh, references that Lacan has made marginally to Kafka and analyzed them as a way to talk about Kafka's work and as well as Lacan's um, uh, impressions on psychoanalysis and what it tells us um, about Freud and Marx as well. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Teresa. Well, good afternoon, first of all. Um, let me thank very warmly the Yanam Prava, I hope I pronounce it correctly, and Ruit in particular for their very kind invitation. It is a great pleasure. of you for attending. Lacan introduces the notion of jouissance, enjoyment, and I'll be calling it jouissance, relatively late in his work. The term jouissance still appears only sporadically in the writings of the 1950s, where it can hardly be said to constitute an original new innovative concept. For instance, in the first two seminars, jouissance is still firmly rooted in the Hegelian, or better, Kojevian, dialectic of master and slave. In short, at this early stage, for Lacan, jouissance is what the other is supposed to enjoy. What the other is supposed to enjoy. We come into being through the other, and are thus alienated or lacking subjects. We identify with the other and want to be in the place of his supposed enjoyment. So the essence of our ego, according to Lacan, is nothing but, to cut a long story short, frustration. And were we to fully reduce ourselves to the place of the other, we could not anyway be satisfied with it. Since, I'm quoting Lacan, it would still be the other's jouissance that we would have gotten recognized there." End of quote. Jouissance then features prominently in Lacan's Seminar on Ethics, Seminar 7, dating back to 1959-1960. Here, the notion acquires several meanings, which are, in my opinion, not fully developed into a unified and consistent concept. Let us try to summarize Lacan's main arguments about jouissance in Seminar 7. First, jouissance can only be inscribed within the law. Or better, jouissance is given exclusively as the jouissance of allegedly transgressing the law. If we try to have it done with the law altogether in the name of a, Lacan's phrase, uninhibited jouissance, Jouissance is not in the least strengthened. On the other hand, it is unexpectedly the law itself that can be regarded as the, quote Lacan, site of some irregularity. Interdictions, as Freud had already understood, grow exponentially all the more we subject ourselves to the law or the superego. Jouissance thus amounts primarily to the law's jouissance. The implementation of the law is as such transgressive, Lacan seems to be saying, and our transgressing it presupposes this state of affairs, i.e., again, that the law is as such transgressive. Second main argument we find in Seminar 7, jouissance is nothing less than an evil, Lacan says, even the evil, to court in that my jouissance inevitably entails my neighbor's suffering. This point was sort of already evident in the dialectic of master and slave, and is now reiterated. Jouissance is what the other is supposed to enjoy. 
whereby I will aim at replacing him, obliterating him at any cost. Jouissance therefore goes together with a suspension, suspension of the pleasure principle as a reciprocal and pleasure principle or least suffering principle. Moreover, given that the evil I desire is also reflexively what is desired by my neighbor, independently of the outcome of our confrontation, jouissance can only be painful somehow for both, Lacan argues, or at best, painful pleasure. My cruelty, in other words, becomes undistinguishable from that of my neighbor. Lacan, however, fails here in Seminar 7 to conclude that, following on his previous claims, this whole libidinal economy is given only within the limits of the law. If jouissance is invariably inscribed within the law, and jouissance is evil, such evil will correspond to the subject's transgression of the law as contained by the law, and as in the end based on the law's own intrinsic evil. It is thus unclear to me how Lacan can then maintain in Seminar 7 that jouissance amounts to something unbearable we, his phrase, cannot stand. This definition contradictorily seems to locate jouissance in an extra-legal domain of, we could say, enhanced feelings, which, according to Lacan's teaching, were never given to begin with and can only be fantasized. Why would the subject not stand what is merely mythical? We have to wait for two underestimated lectures from 1966 to find a clear definition of jouissance which certainly draws on Seminar 7, but also limits the proliferation of incompatible meanings Lacan discusses there. In a paper, in a paper given in Baltimore at John Hopkins, jouissance is identified with what is experienced in the, quote, sensible face of the human being, end of quote. What he feels in the most basic way, Lacan says, between birth and death, that covers, quote, the whole spectrum of pain and pleasure, end of quote. Yet, paradoxically, the supposed subject of such purely sensible face is given only in retrospect by his concrete inability to access such pure jouissance. That is, the subject never enjoys in the sense of using or possessing jouissance, Lacan argues, as is the case, on the contrary, when one enjoys Coca-Cola, Lacan quips. In other words, absolute jouissance and its subject are mythical. Why? Because the pleasure principle as a non-pleasure principle, or least suffering principle, always already provides a barrier, Lacan says, to jouissance, and really existing jouissance is inextricable from this limit, this barrier. As soon as I enjoy myself a little too much, a little too much, this turns into pain, and I moderate my jouissance. Now, on the one hand, this claim would still seem to entail that, although always already lost, jouissance is in itself something excessive the subject could not stand. On the other hand, and this is the crucial novelty with respect to Seminar 7, which possibly solves its tensions, our continuous attempts at disrupting the barrier provided by the pleasure principle and the very existence of a jouissance beyond this barrier we could nonetheless not bear may well be just a dream, Lacan adds. This dream, or more technically fantasy, would be forced upon us by the organization of our organism as a body inseparable from language. The entire construction of the subject whereby signifiers and the body, the law and jouissance become undistinguishable, would be there only to sustain our desire, quote Lacan, to approach, to test this sort of forbidden jouissance, which is the only valuable meaning that is offered to our human life, end of quote. All these points made in the Baltimore paper are restated in the contemporaneous La Place de la Psychanalyse dans la Médicine. 
The human body, Lacan says, does not consist of sheer Cartesian extension. Its very taking place amounts to the fact that, Lacan's phrase, the body feels itself as jouissance. It's difficult to get clearer definitions, even though they are simplistic in a way. Pleasure is a barrier to jouissance. Jouissance follows from a forcing of the pleasure principle and is thus invariably accompanied by pain. Yet most importantly, all the above is valid exclusively from the perspective of human desire, as necessarily mediated by language and the structural fictions that are thus created. Desire is, Lacan's own words, a point of compromise. Desire is, he says in this little known paper, a ladder, a ladder that allows us to climb jouissance in the sense that desire moves farther the barrier of the pleasure principle. But as such, this point is, Lacan explicitly states, a phantasmatic point. So the point of compromise is a phantasmatic point. The ladder leads to a compromise point which is as such phantasmatic. In other words, desire's climb, we could say, of jouissance does not in the least involve its attainment. First and foremost, because it is likely, we will never know it, that there is no extra linguistic, uninhibited, absolute jouissance. Now, given these recurrent difficulties in defining the concept of jouissance, it is, at least for me, all the more interesting to focus on a specific lesson of Seminar 5, so quite early Lacan, 1957, where Lacan decides to basically formally introduce Mr. or Mrs. Jouissance to his audience. Quote, today I will show you the meaning of a notion that is always more or less implicated in the way you handle the notion of desire, still quoting, and that deserves being distinguished from desire. I would say, Father, a notion that cannot begin to be articulated except from the moment when we are sufficiently imbued with the complexity in which this desire is constituted. It is called jouissance, end of quote. Here Lacan is clearly de determined to pin down simply jouissance, yet in bringing the same lesson to a close, he honestly, very honestly concedes that he has only managed, he says, to extract the first gram of jouissance. All we are specifically told is that jouissance should be regarded as, he says, the other pole of human desire. Desire is subverted by language in that it amounts to a desire for recognition. Desiring what the other desires or already supposedly enjoys always presupposes a more profound, we could say, desire to be desired by the very same other I contradictorily aim at replacing. But in spite of such an alienation of desire in language, the fact remains that the subject is nonetheless able to somehow satisfy himself phantasmatically from this predicament, from this impasse. And this is where jouissance lies. Later in Seminar 5, five, Lacan then adds in passing that satisfaction and its failure do essentially coincide. The subject, he says, quote, enjoys his desire. It's difficult to get a more straightforward definition in Lacan, I think. Jouis de son désir. The subject enjoys, then he continues, desiring. Jouis de désiré. So desire is never satisfied, yet jouissance is procured precisely by the subject's, quote, sizing his existence of living being as suffering, that is, as being a subject of desire, end of quote. Or also, from a slightly different perspective, the desire for unlimited, unlimited absolute jouissance depends on the very jouissance obtained from desiring. Now, let's move on to Le Balcon, to Genet. One is tempted to suggest that in Seminar 5, jouissance comes to the fore for the first time not as an exhaustive theoretical concept, but with respect to the way in which it works as a central component of civilization to court in a Freudian sense, and also its discontents. 
Surprisingly, in order to show jouissance in actu, in practice, Lacan refers to comedy, and more specifically, Genet 1956 irreverent play, Les Balcons, The Balcony, which stages a revolution as seen from a brothel. Jouissance has undoubtedly a sexual dimension, suffice it to recall that in French it also means orgasm. But enjoying and explaining, or enjoying and explaining, even just a gram of jouissance requires an elaborate sociopolitical contextualization. Again, jouissance is inextricable from the law and its inherent transgression. How does Genet represent that? Well, by showing what as a rule needs to be hidden, needs to remain hidden in the constituted order of a community. Namely, that jouissance, in this case epitomized in the play by making love to a prostitute, cannot but be sustained by a symbolic function, or better, by the profanation of such symbolic function. Lacan says the assumption of a position of disrespect towards such symbolic function. What does it mean with reference to the content of the play? Well, we have three idol patrons frequent a brothel and through a series of carefully orchestrated artifices assume for the short time of a sexual service the powers of a bishop who forgives a penitent, a judge who punishes a thief, and a general who rides his horse. This is the law of comedy, Lacan says, openly representing what is to enjoy these functions, i.e. putting into question human functions insofar as they are symbolic, and as such support the subject among other subjects, precisely that the subject is usually alienated from these functions. We are not bishops, most of us. And only those believes in the integrity of these functions. In other words, symbolic functions of power on which civilization rests go together not with a neutralization of supposedly pre-existing sexual urges, but on the contrary, with an erotization of the functions themselves. This erotization of symbolic functions is that is what in the end we all, not just bishops and generals, unconsciously idealize as an image of libidinal satisfaction. Without them, human sexuality, like an argues, would not be viable. So, to sum up, in my own word, society is, for Lacan, structurally perverse. Civilization is no doubt discontent, but also content with its discontent. Comedy can therefore not be said to be simply comical, Lacan argues. Comedy daringly renders explicit the inextricable dialectic between the law and its transgression whereby in disrespecting and deriding the law, we actually bring to light jouissance as a disturbing yet fundamental socio-political factor. Accordingly, Lacan stresses that comedy, in the same lesson, Seminar 5, emerges especially at moments of severe socio-political crisis. Aristophanes was active during the Pelop Peloponnesian War and dealt with it in his place. Not randomly, Genet, Le Balcon, by Genet is itself set during a revolution. Lacan then argues that a community represents a group of men exclusively to the extent that it, quote, constitutes the existence of a man as such, with a capital M, above it. An idealized symbolic function in contradiction with which the group of men is determined. But if this is the case, then comedy's caricaturing of the man, the bishop, the judge, the general, as himself returning to the most elementary sexual needs, represents for the community the moment of the end of community. Yes, but this is more dialectically complex, according to Lacan. Yet, and this is crucial, as Lacan contends, the staging of sociopolitical disintegration also paradoxically amounts to the only overt representation of an effective community, he says, as a communion, like the Christian communion. That is, in comedy, each and every subject is shown to profit 
from the substance and matter of the communitarian communion to enjoy it. We all partake of the constituted powers structural perversion willy-nilly, if only in little morsels. Tragedy opposes the individual's jouissance to the law of the community, which invariably obstructs it. Comedy rather indicates that the very fantasy of this tragic and unachievable jouissance supports itself from the consumption of what tragedy, tragedy underestimates, namely what Lacan calls the subjects, he says, common flesh, i.e., again, the point I made just now, the communitarian communion of the, we could say, erotization of the symbolic functions. Perhaps, after all, my point, Oedipus himself only enjoyed playing the dead king with his mother. For Lacan, comedy, and in particular, the balcony, also effectively stage how the unveiling of the obscene side of a constituted order is not sufficient to cause the demise of order as such. In spite of the degradation of symbolic functions, i.e. the identification of the most sacred societal roles with sexual perversions, in the balcony, the relation of the subject to the law, quote Lacan, continues to be presented before us, be sustained, it purely and simply subsists, end of quote. I.e., there is no access to any extra legal domain. Transgression has no beyond. In Genet's play, the real-life dignitaries have apparently all been killed by the revolutionaries. Their impersonators initially lack any legitimacy and know perfectly well that enjoying a function is not the same thing as being it, and I will return to this point later. Yet, by the end of the play, they all accept, albeit reluctantly, to become, to all intents and purposes, bishop, judge, and general. They thus show that society, quote in Lacan, will always, be, will always be a mess, a bordel, which also means a brothel, after, just as before, the revolution. And that revolution, he says, is in, is in this sense a jeu, a game, end of quote. To put it differently, order is somehow preserved even in extreme disorder. In this regard, the most important character of Genet play is, according to Lacan, the chief of police. He's both the last defender of the royal palace and a merely platonic lover of the brothels, of the brothels maîtresse, Irma. The chief prostitute and the chief of police are a couple. The centrality of the police signals that the order of the polis, the city, has been reduced to the sheer maintenance of law and order. And what is astonishing about the chief in the play is that precisely insofar as he embodies, Lacan says, the last resort of all power, no client of the brothel wishes to usurp his function, impersonate him by wearing his uniform and insignia. Everybody wants to be the bishop, the general, but nobody wants to be the chief of police, and the chief of police is quite angry about that. The chief of police keeps on repeating, has anybody asked to be the chief of police? The last resort of power is clearly not a source of jouissance. As Irma, the maîtress, puts it, talking to the chief of police, quote, my dear, your function isn't noble enough to offer dreamers an image that would console them. End of quote. In commenting on the balcony and comedy in general, Lacan states at one point that he is not at all trying to construct a theory. A close reading of the passages at stake, along with others from Seminar 5, puts, I think, such a claim into question. There might well be just a theoretical gram of jouissance in these pages, but Lacan's inventive interpretation of Genet has far-reaching consequences which should be accurately systematized only in the early 1970s through Lacan's logic of sexuation, for which, by the way, the notion of function remains crucial. Keeping to seminar five, the least we can say is that if the community emerges in contrast to the existence of a man as such above it, who is constructed by the community as its structural exception, then 
Lacan's reading of the balcony is importantly distinguishing between two kinds of men as such. The first amounts obviously to the function of constituted power as it is partly embodied and perversely enjoyed by each of us, albeit at a distance, or better, unconsciously. This is a distance, of course, which Genet's grotesque characters do suspend in their impersonations at the Brodo, supersede when they are officially sworn in as bishop, judge, and general, but also with the same move propose again. No doubt somebody else will be impersonating them in some other Brodo. The second man as such corresponds to a, in Lacan's words, again, last resort of power, which is not strictly speaking a function, but a pure symbol that nobody wants to embody because it is, after all, supremely impotent and solitary. The last term of power stands at the same time for no more than a residue of power, Lacan specifies. In its very essence, power is always already merely residual. Although he sustains the function of power as the perverse dialectic of the law and its transgression, which produces jouissance out of a lack of satisfaction, the man as such in question here, the chief of police, should actually not even be considered a man. Indeed, the chief of police love and lust for the maîtresse is, we are told by Genet, long gone. In this other sense, the man as such reduces himself to guarding, guarding the empty place of a jouissance without limit that would, would conditionally lie beyond the law. Yet in doing so, he rather signals only the sheer impossibility of such absolute jouissance. This is why nobody wants to be him. Given that he thus also threatens the basic mirage of transcendence on which civilization and its really existing jouissance is built, his truly pathetic nature, usually masked by his iron grip, emerges again only at times of profound socio-political crisis. Again, no comforting image can be extracted from the chief of police image. Predictably, this pure symbol, symbol of impotence, or better, power as impotence, is for Lacan what he calls the phallus. The phallus amounts to, quote Lacan, a fundamental signifier, a general symbol, still quoting, of this margin that always separates me from my desire, end of quote. The phallus, therefore, marks the alteration desire undergoes due to its entrance into language, the fact that jouissance is given as forever detached, unachievable. More to the point, in order to subjectivize himself in the network of signifiers in which he is structurally alienated and out of which he would be just a helpless animal, the subject, quote Lacan, must hold his power a subject from a sign. Given his alienation, still quoting, he only obtains this sign by mutilating himself of something through whose luck everything else will take on value, end of quote. This operation is, of course, what psychoanalysis calls castration. And incidentally, Alenka, in her work, has shown the close connection between castration and structure and the structure of comedy. But the phallus, as the signifier of power, obtained only through a fundamental mutilation, cannot just simply fall from the sky, Lacan adds when he's speaking about Genet. The phallus coalesces around the image of the erect penis at the end of the day, without, however, coinciding with the organ insofar as it belongs to the body of a subject. So on the one hand, since ancestral times and in different cultures, the phallic image has obviously stood for, quote Lacan, what of life manifests itself in its purest way, as turgidity and thrust, end of quote. But on the other hand, again, 
the very fullness of such privileged object of the word of life is precisely never experienced by the subject, which leads him to hide the phallic image, repress the state of affairs, and organize around it a series of secretive activities from sublime Dionysiac cults to obscene graffiti in public lavatories. When it openly appears before the community, the phallic image is quickly barred, stricken through. Think about it. Eunuchs become the improbable spokesman of rites of fecundity. On ancient Greek vases, perfidious demons whip satires endowed with huge sexual organs. Even in contemporary ultra-liberal societies, zealous censors certify, cut, or obscure pornographic material. The phallic image in all these instances is barred, stricken through. Lacan believes that the twofold unfolding of this process is best captured again by comedy. Comedy, he says, stages the full development of the phallic image, only to make it then disappear soon after in the name not only of the new law, but of its really existing jouissance as inherent to the law. The first gram of jouissance, the one enjoyed by the perverse clients of the brothel and unconsciously by each of us, is all the jouissance that there is. In short, to sum up this passage about the phallus, the power of the phallic symbol ultimately lies in its signifying itself as powerless. How? Through the disfigurement of the phallic image. The power of the phallic symbol ultimately lies in its signifying itself as powerless through the disfigurement of the phallic image. Now, according to Lacan, this is precisely what Le Balcon, the balcony, deals with, especially in its second half. Now, back to Genet. The chief of police, the last bastion of ordered politeia in a police ravaged by the revolution, is doing everything to prevent the inevitable. The queen gets nonetheless killed. Together with a representative from the royal palace, he, the chief of police, however, manages to persuade the maîtresse Irma to stand in for her, the queen. So the chief prostitute becomes the queen. As well as to make the perverts authentically assume the functions of bishop, judge, and general, they had up to that moment enjoyed to impersonate. The chief of police also previously enlisted a muscular bodyguard to protect the brothel. But significantly, and Lacan fails to notice this, such a, quote Genet, big doll made up as an executioner seems rather vulnerable. As Irma remarks, quote, you, chief of police, wanted a pillar, a shaft, a phallus present, hall erected, and on its feet, here it is. You imposed on me that hunk of congested meat, beautiful, even in the English translation, that communicant with wrestler's arms. He may look, look as a strong man at a fair, but you don't realize how fragile he is. And she concludes, I am his man, and he relies on me, end of quote. So the phallic image epitomized by this bodyguard as a phallus around which the community's communion normally revolves, needs to remain hidden and shielded, evocatively thanks to the complicity of a woman. What follows in the play proves, however, that this concealment is no longer possible in the balcony. In the midst of all these events, the police, as the last resource of power, strangely continues to be mostly preoccupied with one thing. Quote, has anybody asked to be chief of police? Has anybody recognized his grandeur?" End of quote. He is tired and aging, and having demonstrated that he alone guarantees order, now only wishes to be granted access to a respected as profaned function, out of which he could finally enjoy. So someone convinces him, the chief of police, to adopt a new, more appealing uniform, a gigantic phallus painted in the tricolor, the national French colors. As soon as the chief of police, the phallic symbol, as the general symbol of the margin, 
that separates a community from the satisfaction of its desire, as soon as the chief of police delegates custody of the image he had so far preserved effectively in disguise and is ready to wear it, which actually would have shown his true nature, i.e. the literal, literal in this case, this is the beauty of Genet, coincidence between the last resort of power and a powerless dickhead. As soon as the chief of police delegates custody of the image he had preserved, a young plumber who, not coincidentally, is also in charge of a revolutionary squad, Roger, asks what it takes to look like a chief of police. He is at the point immediately dressed with the phallus and most importantly buried alive in a room adorned like a mausoleum, out of which he will exit in the end only after literally castrating himself. On my rugs, on the new carpet, the new queen Irma cries out. The new dignitaries have, in the meantime, successfully been introduced as bishop, as general, as judge to the city, as real figures of authority. Satisfied with this outcome and having ascertained that his testicles are, after all, still in place, the chief of police resumes his habitual role. Quote, he places, this is Genet, he places his hands on his fly, very visibly fills his balls, and reassured, heaves a sigh. The counter-revolution is completed. Now, the important message of Le Balcon is well conveyed by the chief of police. Quote, that plumber, the revolutionary plumber, didn't know how to handle his role. End of quote. That is, he didn't know how to enjoy. He didn't know that enjoyment is inherent to power and symbolic functions. Tragic comic attempts at directly embodying the phallus as an image do not lead to an announcement of feelings, but to a lethargic, painless, and infinite death. As the prostitute Carmen says to the plumber, the truth is that you are dead, or better, that you are not stopping dying." End of quote. In other words, the true nature and the ultimate nature of the phallus is that it ultimately stands all alone without a partner, Lacan will say in later seminars. Now, Let's focus on the plumber for a bit. Lacan comments that the plumber, quote, represents man's simple de desire to rejoin in a fashion that can be authenticated and directly assumed his own existence and his own thought, a value which is not distinct from his flesh, end of quote. The plumber's revolutionary activities witness to the fact that he stands for the subject, quote Lacan again, who has fought so that something which we have called up to the present, the bordel, the mess, the brothel of society, rediscovers its basis, its norm, a state that can be accepted as fully human, end of quote. And yet, the plumber we have seen can be reintegrated in the community only, Lacan says, on condition that he is castrated. Even more ironically, in castrated himself and those promoting again the phallus to the state of the signifier, the symbolic state, the revolutionary plumber ends up perpetuating the order he had himself disrupted in the name of a fully human condition. So on the one hand, his mutilation, the mutilation of the plumber, providentially prevents the chief of police from identifying himself directly with the phallic image. And Lacan seems to locate in this identification of the phallic image and the phallus, a symbol of power, the presupposition, he says, for totalitarian dictatorships. On the other hand, the plumber's castration is nonetheless, and for the same reason, what allows the chief of police to be happy, to keep on maintaining order, simply not by having somebody impersonating him, but simply by filling his balls. Quote the chief of police, through my, through my image may be castrated in every brothel in the world, I am, gentlemen, intact. I remain intact, 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 end of quote. In turn, the restoration of the phallus to the status of the signifier will then once more sustain the perverse everyday jouissance of the law, now clearly sanctioned by the fact that the new queen, Irma, 
used to be herself a prostitute. The norm is thus inextricably related to the bordel, the brothel or a mess, depending on how you translate the French. Now, I'll, I'm getting to the final part of the paper, the, third, the final third. Now, reading Genet play closely, we can recover, I believe, at least two other brilliant lame motifs which Lacan doesn't pay any attention to, but which profoundly resonate with his Lacan's later logic of sexuation. The first concerns the way in which the notion of function, symbolic function, complicates any straightforward understanding of, we could say, being and truth. The second indicates that woman is a structural component of the fundamental human function based on the phallus, in that, and this is crucial, she maintains she maintains it by further disrupting it. Concerning the notion of function, arguably, statistically, the most perva pervasive term of Genet's Le Balcon, Genet stages through the three male perverts, the bishop, the judge, and the general, what I would call a further deconstruction of the Aristotelian logic of subject and attribute to which we all, in the end, still cling in our, in our everyday lives. In this regard, I would single out five elements from the place which deconstruct the Aristotelian logic of subject and attribute. First point, brief, they're all brief points. First point, the function precedes, the symbolic function precedes the subject. Quote Genet, the bishop speaking, the majesty, the dignity that light up my person do not emanate from my personal merits. The majesty, the dignity that light me up come from a more mysterious brilliance. The fact that, the bishop says, the, bishops, the bishop preceded me, end of quote. Second point, the subject intends to transgress the function to access what? Well, again, an absolute jouissance. Quote Genet, the bishop speaking, in order to destroy all functions, I want to cause a scandal and fill you up. You slut, you bitch, you trollop, you trump, end of quote. Third point, this transgression is, as we've seen at the beginning, impossible because performing a function excludes being it. Quote, again, the bishop, a function is a function. It is not a mode of being, end of quote. I'd like that new ontologists learn this lesson. A function is a function. It's not a mode of being. Fourth point, performing a function in spite of the distance that always separates the subject from being the function in any simple way entails the marking of this distance. Indeed, not coincidentally, all the perverts, dignitaries, are mounted on skates in the play. Fifth and final point, given that it does not denote any non-performative being, a function is thus not simply true or false. Quote Genet, Irma speaking, it's the plumber leaving, Carmen. Which one? Irma. The real one, Carmen. Which is the real one? Irma. The one who repairs the tops, Carmen. Is the other one fake? As for woman, and this is the final part of my talk, we can schematically say that Le Balcon assigns woman four different yet, re yet related posi symbolic positions in the community. One, that of the queen who never appears in person in the play. Two, that of the unredeemable prostitute Carmen who resists and confuses her clients all the more they think to own her. Three, that of the redeemed prostitute Chantal who outdoes the plumber her lover, Roger, in motivating the revolutionaries, but is soon killed, and for that of the maîtresse, Irma, who supervises the other prostitutes, is perfectly aware of the fact that the uh, brothel is nothing else than a, she says, house of illusions, and then finally becomes herself the new queen. From a Lacanian perspective, and briefly, I think this, five, this four position can be taken to represent, in turn, one, 
woman's liaising with man only as in this junction with man's universality, the queen. Two, woman's own singularity as overlapping with the very place of man's fantasy, Carmen. Three, woman's singularity as in tension with her desire to embody the universal woman, Chantal. Four, woman's opening as singular onto something which man cannot experience, and which the phallus as signifier tentatively veils only thanks to woman's own complicity. This would be Irma. Significantly, by the way, there is no king in the play. He's not mentioned a single time. We are left to assume that his destiny must have been, once upon the time, the same as that of the plumber, the stricken through phallic image, whose immense glory, we are told, will indeed itself necessarily be propagated only, je ne sais, in absentia by the words of a slave. The chief of police is, unsurprisingly, such slave of the king. It is he, the phallic signifier, who pairs with the queen, though solely, solely by keeping at a certain distance from her. As he puts it at the beginning of the play, quote, the queen's bridge was blown up last night, end of quote. Community, therefore, founds itself on the mismatched alliance between, on the one hand, the evanescent phallus and its demarcation, on the other, of woman as absent. But, and this is crucial, while the chief of police sustains the various masculine functions as somehow credible in their contradiction, in short, the perverts are the man by not being him, and that's why they're sworn in, the queen's feminine activities remain, strictly speaking, in a logical sense, undecidable. As the envoy from the royal palace continues to repeat, quote, the queen is embroidering and she's not embroidering. The queen is embroidering and she's not embroidering, end of quote. This undecidability in a quite technical sense has strong repercussions even on the woman one would assume to be most vulnerable to man's perverse power. The bishop, the judge, and the general pay the prostitutes to play the corresponding roles of sinner, thief, and horse. Yet the resulting couples, performative couples, are continuously put into question by women. The sinner has sinned and has not sinned. The thief has robbed and has not robbed. The horse is a horse and is not a horse. Community rests on the semblance of a bionivocal relation between the sexes which doesn't really hold up. All men have a function, ultimately supported by the phallic signifier, only in as much as woman is never entirely caught up in it. Now, this symbolic positioning of woman as not all phallic allows woman, epitomized here by Carmen, to recognize and assume that a function never lets us be simply ourselves. Quote Carmen, am I to have only myself and be only myself? No, madam, never, end of quote. Such a liberating awareness is, however, strictly parallel to the prostitutes supporting what they call the vice and misery of man, men's blindness to the fact that the roles they fulfill in society sealed by marriage are inseparable from perverse jouissance. Still, Carmen speaking, when they are with their wives whom they love, they keep a tiny, small-scale version of their revels in a brothel, tucked away in the back of their heads." End of quote. As soon as woman deludes herself into believing she's able to escape man's misery, she rather, according to Genet, ends up fully playing his faulty and never-ending game. Chantal leads the revolutionaries through her beautiful singing in the play, and in the name of the revolution, she renounces even the jealous love of the plumber Roger. Yet, Chantal is bought off, literally, soon after, exchanged as a commodity more pricey than any prostitute, and sacrificed for what turns out to be an inconclusive cause. Quote, Roger the plumber speaking, Chantal belongs, Chantal, standing up, to nobody, Roger, to my section, the man, to the insurrection, the man. How many women do you want in exchange, Roger? Hundred women, a thousand, and maybe more, end of quote. In trying to embody the woman, 
with a capital W, no longer subjected to man's perversion, in even refusing the love of the supremely perverse in the end man who shares her goal, Roger, Chantal only becomes the expandable standard according to which all other women acquire a value for man. She thus loses what Lacan would call her singularity, which Carmen instead proudly boasted. Roger makes this point about Chantal clear, quote, Chantal is no longer a woman, une femme, Genet writes, in order to fight against an image, Chantal has frozen into an image, with a capital I, end of quote. So if Car Carmen only enjoys by disrupting the image of the whore, man imposing on her, yet at the same time abides by it, and Chantal, like Roger, does not at all know Jouissance. Genet does, however, also present an element, we could say, of woman's jouissance as real, beyond the inextricability of truth from falsity and the jeu between perverse power and revolution. Irma's jewels, bijou. Quote, Irma, everything is a sham, but I have my jewels. They are the only things I have that are real, end of quote. Man's chilling game makes Irma, she says, sad and melancholy. Or as Carmen has it, quote Carmen, viewed from here, where in any case men show their naked self, life seems to be so remote, so profound, that it has all the unreality of a film or of the birth of Christ in a manger, end of quote. But woman still has her diamonds, the feminine bijou accompany the masculine and circular Jew or game of law, transgression and revolution from beginning to end, yet also remain external to this logic. Tellingly, men appear to be completely oblivious to the splendor of the bijou, echoing the idiocy of the prefect of the police in Edgar Allan Poe's The Purloined Letter, who cannot see the Queen's letter even if it is under his nose, the chief of police in Le, in Le Balcon blatantly ignores repeatedly Irma's bijou. And also, while the perverts manage to perform sexually only with the assistance of the mitre, the book, and the sparred boots, Irma rather truly enjoys her bijou, precisely insofar as she does not ever wear or use them. Jouissance, feminism Jouissance here somehow suspends the symbolic order and its imaginary refractions. Woman's specifically feminine Jouissance is for Lacan supplementary to any dialectic between being and appearing, truth and semblance. Yet, and this is very important, it does not transcend, it is not something above such dialectic. Irma, in fact, does not repeat Chantal's mistake. Irma accepts to become queen, and precisely at that very moment, Chantal gets killed in the play. So on the one hand, it is only thanks to Irma's consent that the chief of police can still grab his balls, significantly in French, is bijou de famille. The sham starts all over again. But on the other hand, Irma the prostitute is quite clearly for Genet, and Lacan would agree, the queen and she, she's not the queen. So Irma is the queen and she's not the queen. If taken seriously, undecidability, being and not being something, opens up and continuously threatens what Lacan elsewhere calls the circle between inherent transgression, more and more explicit in our late capitalist world, and revolution. So undecidability can open up the apparent circle between um, like capitalism, more power, more generally, and revolution. As queen, even the statues of Irma's bijou become open to doubt in the play, that is, resistant against any kind of transcendent reification of the bijou, of the real. Irma, so I'll be real? My jewels will be real? Question mark. Feminine jouissance and the not all logic it expresses is clearly insufficient, I would argue, to conclude, to straightforwardly produce an alternative form of politics. And by the way, psychoanalysis is not inherently political. But feminine jouissance can fruitfully be developed toward a novel 
political orientation that, so to speak, transgresses the by now imperative late capitalist injunction to transgress. So let's transgress transgression. Should we finally regard Le Balcon and Lacan's reading of it as a call for political apathy? Not at all. In his avertisement preceding the play, Genet provides in this regard a succinct but effective definition of the function of the artist, which may, may, open question, perhaps also fit that of the Lacanian psychoanalyst, quote Genet. The function of the artist or of the poet is not finding a practical solution to the problems of evil. They should accept to be damned. They will lose their soul if they have one. That doesn't matter. But their work, their artistic work, will be an active explosion, an act, starting from which the public reacts as it pleases, as it can. End of quote. Thank you very much. Door for questions. I was wondering if you could clarify something. Thanks, okay. that was great. Um, you said that there are, for Lacan, four symbolic, no, uh, your reading of um, the balcony, there are four symbolic positions, the mm -hmm. queen, the prostitute, redeemed prostitute, and madam, or, yeah, yeah. four of four, or, I don't know. Uh, then the, you said that there are four positions that can demonstrate man's liaison with man, wait, there was another four set of things that correspond with those four positions right after that you went over really fast, and I was wondering if you could um, reiterate the, the four those. feminine positions in, in the play. Yes. Yeah. So let's put it very bluntly. I mean, the queen is a missing universal in Lacanian terms. The queen is a sort of like missing universal in Lacanian terms, that is to say, for Lacan, there is no universality of woman. Hmm? Irma, the fourth one, quite explicitly, I take it to uh, represent something which is irreducible to uh, masculine logic, that is to say, the bijou in this sense, which for Lacan would stand for a feminine jouissance, which is um, somehow beyond the phallic logic, but uh, not transcendent. And the two figures of the prostitute, uh, the redeemed and the unredeemed, um, epitomize, in a sense, the partiality of women's being taken in the phallic function as both an accomplice, but an accomplice of it, but also disrupting it, and that would be uh, Carmen, and the hysterical position, Chantal. But it becomes quite... You know, like, I don't see the um, usefulness, really, of developing that far the things. I mean, I think... So what is and what is not? Is that what it is? Well, let's put it like that. So we, we've been trying to uh, say that there is no universality of woman, one, uh, that woman nonetheless is uh, caught in the phallic function, uh, three, that she can uh, actually uh, want to acquire an universality, and that would be the hysterical position, and four, that nonetheless she's not all phallic, and I will be Irma in the Bijou. But this is, you know, to get more into that, you have to get into Lacanian logic in a sense. I mean, I think it's more productive if you actually keep it at the level of, of, of the play in this context, yeah. But the important issue is for me here that uh, what can Lacan give to politics in a sense? And I, I think this, is, this play is a nice way in which one sees how um, Lacan's infamous idea that what the revolution wants is only to go back to the starting point. So he says that like, revolution is just a revolution in astronomic sense. Yes, he said that, but at the same time there are ways in which we can uh, go beyond that statement. And I think like reading this play, the play itself, Jeanette plays, but also Lacan's reading of the play, that, does give us a way to actually indicate a kind of like tentative uh, political um, direction in which psychoanalysis could, could, be, could be 
use, and I called it the uh, direction of undecidability, or you can also call it in other terms, it's not the same thing, of course, logical, but of incompleteness. I, I don't know this. I don't know this literature, so I couldn't quite follow many things you said. Uh, but um, uh, so just some clarifications. Uh, first of all, is jouissance a uh, trans historical structure which occurs in all social formations, or is it something that appears mm -hmm. in capitalism? Um, and secondly, uh, you mentioned um, going against. Uh, what was that? Sorry. Sorry. No, the second point, I didn't hear the beginning. Yeah, the second point is, uh, you mentioned going against, uh, uh, that Lacanian logic goes against Aristotelian logic. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering um, why you think so in the sense that um, it's possible to explain the kinds of examples you were giving um, with Aristotelian logic. Uh, so when you say, for example, uh, being and not being or X and not X, mm. you can explain that in terms of X applying to certain attributes and not X applying to different attributes and right. so you can resolve the contradiction that would arise. Do you think uh, so? Uh, so what I am saying is that, uh, so, so anyway, uh, what is the warrant then if, if uh, you are uh, going to uh, resort to a different logic? What is the justification for that different logic? What is the argument you would give to support it, um, given um, that we overwhelmingly use right. Aristotelian logic? Well, I tackle the first question, the second question first, because I think it's easier to tackle than the first one. Um, you don't have to be Lacanian to actually accept as um, fait accompli the overcoming of Aristotelian logic. I mean, formal logic has overcome Aristotelian logic since the end of the 19th century. So there is a common acknowledgement outside of psychoanalysis, like even in specifically logical circles that, you know, Aristotelian logic and what followed it had to be, uh, I mean, this is the story of 20th century logic. And Lacan happens to be just a psychoanalyst who by reading Frege, by being uh, uh, acquainted with Peirce, et cetera, et cetera, tries to develop a logic of sexuation using his own way 20th century logic, uh, and that would be a very difficult discussion, very interesting, very difficult. I mean, I have like a, almost half of my recent book on that topic. But if the question is why going against Aristotelian logic, the blunt answer is that because Aristotelian logic does not, is, not, is not any longer enough for the, the homo sapiens species, and they felt that already in the 19th century. That no, I, 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 certainly, I mean, Frege and Russell and the whole, you know, Gödel and all these people who yeah. developed 20th century logic, um, uh, though they developed Aristotle's ideas further and refined them in various ways, and they, of course, added things like. But that's, that's really. I mean, one can claim anything, but you know, like arguing that the basics uh, of uh, Frege's formal logic is uh, continuing Aristotle is very difficult to defend. I mean, Frege's philosophical insight, uh, basic insight, is that the logic of subject and attribute doesn't work. No, I agree. You need a function, and you see, like I work on the function here, right. like uh, in Genet, and right. I can work on the function in that sense right. that you not you logically no longer should be contented to think in terms of subjects and attributes. Right, but more recent logic has shown that function and object can be translated into predicate. In other words, there are right. two different ways of approaching uh, logical categories, and uh, you know this is all through. No, I, I, I accept century. that. I accept that. I mean, yeah. there, are also, there are also like Thomistic readings of Jacques Lacan, so you see. Right. There are also like those who read Lacan through St. Thomas, so. Right. So I, I suspect that, uh, you know, your use of words like undecidability, incompleteness and so on would not be accepted by the logicians, the mainstream logicians of the 20th century. They would right. find it heterodox. Oh, of course, that is a completely different topic. I yeah. mean, why going against the Aristotelian logic is a pretty easy no. question to answer. Yes. Uh, why can we, how can we make a, a, the Lacanian use of logic acceptable and palatable for formal logici logicians? Well, that, that requires a much longer explanation. Okay, fair. Yeah, yeah. yeah.
And the, the first question was about, that's a really interesting question, the question about whether Jewissance is transhistorical or not. In a sense, it is transhistorical, that is to say there is something about the way in which, we, very simplifying, we live our sexuality and phenomenologic experience, pleasure, pleasure in pain, uh, as a species, which is fundamentally, for Lacanian psychoanalysis, Lacanian psychoanalysis derailed and has to, be, has to do with language. So if you define uh, our species as uh, homo sapiens or homo loquens, then Jewissance has been there uh, since the beginning, ever since the first Neanderthal idiots uh, said something. This is a quote from Lacan. Um, but that transhistorical trait, this invariant, if you want to put it in a more kind of like Chomskyan manner. Right. Uh, so there is a human nature, if you want to put it like very bluntly, is there a human nature for Lacan? Mm -hmm. Yes or no, Foucault, Chomsky, more Chomsky than Lacan, mm -hmm. than, than Foucault. But then the important thing is that, of course, that transhistoricity of jouissance and of language needs to be actually fought historically in a non-sequential chronological way. And these are, this is the theory of so-called discourses in Lacan. Hey, great. Thanks a lot for that paper. I mean, I'm Thank also a great fan of the... So I want to talk about the balcony a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, let me say, I really appreciate... So I, the, in the first part of the paper, what I thought was very interesting, I mean, I might phrase it a little differently, but I think that there's a potential to sort of develop a Lacanian theory of autoerotism, which is different than the Freudian theory. Mm -hmm. Because Freud would start, okay, from the body of need, and then it discovers a kind of satisfaction in the course of of needs that, that spins off from the body. Mm -hmm. kind of a, and whereas Lacan would start from the idea of society organizing according to social roles mm -hmm. for the management, okay, an organization of the, of the social order, but that produces a kind of surplus enjoyment which then spins off. And then what, what the balcony does in those early scenes is try to isolate that very specific pleasure mm -hmm. of inhabiting social roles. Yeah. So I think that's extremely interesting. Now, my question, though, is about... Look, it's a, it's, 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 it's an enjoyment, not a pleasure, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. enjoyment, yeah. Yeah, in, the, in the technical term. Um, my question is this, though. Like, for me, I think there's two... I mean, there's many wonderful kind of jokes in the play, but I think there's two big jokes, like two jokes running mm. through. And one you talked about quite um, extensively, and that's, you know, the chief of police keeps asking, like, doesn't anybody want to be the... Mm -hmm. You know, doesn't anybody want to dress up like a cop? Mm -hmm. And, of course, the answer is always no. No one wants mm -hmm. to be a cop. You know, unlike you are a revolu uh, unless you are a revolutionary. Well, because only in the end. Important. Of course, in the end, then this is the great joke, that the failed revolutionary then you know, becomes the chief of police. But the point is, I mean, I think for Genet, that why, why is the cop, you know, why does nobody want to inhabit that role? Because the cop for Genet doesn't have the same kind of aura or glory, mm -hmm. doesn't have um, uh, the same kind of mystery as a judge, a bishop, because he just embodies violence. That he, mm -hmm. instead, of, instead of authority, he's a figure of violence. And Genet talks about this in other texts, like in the Thief's Journal, that mm -hmm. Genet himself has a kind of, kind of um, ambivalent fascination with the police mm -hmm. because the police actually murders. And mm -hmm. there's something incredibly contemporary about this. Mm -hmm. So when you read Absolutely. this play, in the context, especially like the American context and the recent like, struggles about police violence, this becomes extremely um, contemporary. The other, so the other great joke... And this, correct me if I'm wrong, but I didn't hear you comment on this one mm -hmm. or as much. And that's the joke that the people in the beginning, these normal bourgeois who dress up mm. and play these sort of social power roles, in the end of the play are forced to actually assume the roles that they were just playing mm -hmm. at. Mm -hmm. Like the, and uh, in a way, I mean... Jesus Christ, the Trump... Exactly. Yeah. In a way, reading you know, the play today, it becomes so relevant to contemporary. It's as if Genet had foreseen the American elections and had already diagnosed them. Because essentially, if you update the play, you have these characters who are in a reality TV show, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, they just step into the positions of power, mm -hmm. which is effectively what happened in the last American election. That, In a way, like, Genet has a kind of theory of the society of the spectacle, mm -hmm. and the way that the spectacle, or the images, become autonomous, but also mm -hmm. not only the kind of enjoyment, you know, the yeah. kind of autonomous enjoyment, but they actually assume, in the end, in a kind of weird inversion, they assume effective controlled society, and you even see that the joke there is that the bishop, I think, or the judge, they start complaining. They're like, oh, we don't really want to do this mm -hmm. because it ruins our pure enjoyment. And people also commented on Trump after the election <laughs> that as soon as he got elected, you could see something changed in his face because now he actually has to mm -hmm. govern. And that's not nearly as fun, mm -hmm. you know, you 
lose the sense of the pure just enjoyment, the aura of doing it. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, thanks for the I mean, comments. I think it's I mean, an extremely relevant play for today. That's what I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's Uncanny. also what, I ca what caught my attention. And Lacan's reading, by the way, is quite short. It's like two or three pages and very dense. So I did a lot of like unpacking and additions. I mean, why nobody wants to be the cop? Well, this question, and to put it in a more technical sense, one could say because you have to distinguish between the contaminated symbolic phallus with imaginary and uh, projections and the pure symbol. The pure symbol is unbearable because it actually marks a void, the absence of a sexual relationship. Mm. So th that would be the Lacanian way of putting it. The other way of putting it, well, uh, it's what I call the two men as such. You know, like uh, nobody wants to be the cop, but everybody wants to be the other um, dignitaries, because in those dignitaries there is a contamination of symbolic power and uh, the imaginary projections that allow us to actually enjoy all the community, make the community enjoy through them, right? And I think the, 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 the question of, of violence is also important. I mean, it's, it's the sheer fragility of the pure symbol of power that makes it stand up. Only I, I, I refer to what Lacan says about having an iron grip, right? Like the police has an iron grip, but that is only La mask. To, um, um, to hide, to veil, the, the fact that the, let's say, the foundation of the symbolic order is the consequence of a mismatch. That is to say, and that's the sexual uh, aspect, that there is no relation in terms of ratios between uh, men and women, hence uh, even sexuality is supported by the symbol, right? But as Lacan will say later on, I think, the chief of police stands for what Lacan will call the phallus as all alone, all alone. Mm? Nobody wants to be the chief of police because th 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 that is like a symbol of power which cannot be paired up with anything. But at the same time, it is structural. It sustains an entire edifice. And the, the construction of fantasies um, around symbolic functions that are eroticized, like the one that are described in the, in the, in the, in the play. The inversion of the people, people become, becoming the real Trump, the real Trump, yeah? yeah. How, do you, how do you move from, really, from being the, symbol, the, imper, the, impersonate, the Trump impersonator to the real Trump? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's really sh short, that part, if I remember correctly. But anyway, I think, you know, that one is Jesus Christ. Somebody who wants to be a, a judge, a bishop, and, or, or a general, but Jesus Christ belongs to the same set in the sense of... Uh, the play. I mean, it's, it is a symbolic function, right? Na Napoleon. I mean, why, why could why could you enjoy um, by identifying with a representative of uh, a symbolic function such as uh, the general, and not enjoy by identifying with a symbolic uh, function such as, let's say, the. the uh, Jesus Christ in the play. You, yeah, I don't see the difference. I, I don't know. Maybe you can clarify. Do you, do you see my point? No, I, I, I think, well, I don't want to. I just think that there's, I have to say, that maybe, there's, uh, maybe I see it a little differently or something else mm -hmm. at stake. That you could say a, a certain criticism would be that political uh, figures are corrupted by the enjoyment they have in their function. Mm -hmm. it's something else to say that actually um, people who are purely alienated in the image that assume real roles of power, that that's a kind of shift in mm -hmm. the, the kind of structure of, a, of, a, of how society is organized. Mm -hmm. and, and that but I would Genet say is, is, is kind of diagnosing this uh, very uh, there, is, there is certainly like a contamination between imaginary and symbolic in the enjoyment uh, that uh, the impersonator obtain. But I would say like, uh, for me at least, those are purely or mostly symbolic functions. I mean, the lures of the, the image are epitomized by the hysterical character, Chantal. The woman who wants to be a fool. Reveal my deep-seated suspicion of Lacan, but um, I was just thinking about these four archetypes that you're mm -hmm. bringing up. So the queen who is absent, the mm -hmm. prostitute who is not redeemable, the prostitute who is redeemable because she dies, and then the mm -hmm. madam who becomes the queen and therefore is absent. 
um, mm -hmm. in this sort of cycle. And mm -hmm. so I'm thinking about the comment that you start this, the third section of your paper with, which is that um, women are structural components that maintain the phallus by further disrupting it. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm sort of con confused about how to think about this in terms of power and politics. That, that would be Carmen. Right, well, because also there's this, this um, tension that you bring up between women mm. and image. Um, but I, I guess my question is about how to think about this commitment to a particular idea of mm -hmm. you know, woman or man when mm -hmm. it seems that in my understanding of Lacan's reading of the play through you mm -hmm. is that this is really a bit of a foil for particular mm -hmm. kinds of power since there are actually right. no women present, that they're actually right. representing absence because there's something that's unattainable right. through that and not just through this notion of the right. palace. So the question is... Like, if you're talking about disruption and you're right. talking about transgression... It doesn't seem to you like is, being disruptive at all. Right, like what is, that com what is right, the commitment right. to these particular categories when right, 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 right. the larger... Well, that, that's a difficult question because like, it, it entails simplicity, like discussing the entire connection between like in you know, psychoanalysis and feminism, if not gender studies. I mean, what I can say very straightforwardly is that, well, A, uh, man and woman, for those of you who do not know anything about Lacan, uh, are not to be re referred to uh, biological characteristics. It's, it's, one becomes a man or a woman, right? Um, and secondly, yeah, I would even stop there because there's already quite a lot, in a sense. So what Lacan calls like a phallic logic is a way to compensate for what seems to be a missing natural rela relation in, in, in the sexuality of human beings, right? And that phallic logic is a logic which is incomplete or not all. And woman, and in this case, like the uh, character of uh, Carmen seems to be uh, the clearest exam example of that, is both involved in, this is not a logic in the way like a, you think things in such and such a way. This is like a transcendent, quasi Kantian transcendental structure for Lacan. Woman is both caught in the same phallic logic, but also incompletely caught in this logic. Hence, what I think can be seen as a potentially subversive, uh, uh, a potentially, potentially subversive uh, element of, of this function. The, the, the question is more than legitimate. The, the answer, you know, would require a book that nobody has, to my knowledge, to the best of my knowledge, already, already written. Yeah. But if you don't know much about Lacan, I mean, um, keep in mind that man and woman. Are, well, there are, there are two. They are symbolic. Sorry, there are symbolic categories. There are symbolic categories. And let's say, like, what does Lacan share with uh, gender studies? Well, the fact that. Uh, Men and women are symbolic categories, to simplify things. What does Lacan not share with gender studies? There are two sexes. There's zillions of uh, ima imaginary ident sexual identifications, but there are two sexes defined uh, in that complex manner. That is to say, not as straightforward. About. So sexuality is about two, okay, which are, are not to be identified in a traditional patriarchal way. but. That is the basic logic, and that's where I think the basic distinction between gender studies and Lacan lie. But it's a challenging question. I hope I said something. Okay, we will now close the floor. Thank you so much for your questions, and thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.